um, ran in addition to her oncology, oncology and palliative care um, nurse practitioner's role is a current COVID-19 immunizer and a regular volunteer with the COVID-19 Resources Canada. Um, they've been providing free Zoom sessions for folks to understand more about their vaccine options. Um, Rand, thank you so very much for coming back. I know that you have some slides. Are you, can you hear me, okay, Michelle? Yes, I can. And I'm going to disappear so we can bring up your slides. And I'll reintroduce uh, my little co-presenter today, Jasper, who's uh, happy to be here and says, hi, everyone. <laughs> um, and so to start off, I just wanted to say, you know, I, we heard in the press conference this afternoon that there's a, a plan to try and uh, the number one um, strategy that Minister Copping uh, announced is that he's going to increase ICU capacity. And as someone has been who's been helping out in the ICU lately, I, just, I really want to reiterate, we don't want people in ICU. This can't be our, our end goal. Um, once someone's sick enough to require ICU care, their life may never be the same again. They may have chronic health issues thereafter. They may have significantly diminished quality of life. Um, we want to keep people out of ICU. Um, and so I just wanted to start also by saying we receive a lot of questions uh, in this group about treatments for COVID-19. Uh, and I think they're good questions. You know, I, like many others, I'm always interested in learning about the latest treatments for COVID-19. Um, but the bottom line is that right now we have very limited, proven, effective treatments for COVID-19. Uh, there are thousands of, thousands of clinical trials ongoing that are assessing various treatments for COVID-19. But as of right now, there's only a small handful of uh, treatments that work. And typically, these treatments uh, are referred are reserved for uh, people who are very sick already and already in hospital or ICU. Um, and so, yeah, of course, in addition to the severe outcomes that are always mentioned in the news, hospitalizations and death, uh, we also really want to prevent people from getting COVID-19 so that they don't end up with later long-term consequences of COVID infection like long uh, COVID. Um, and so I, I had said this analogy on Twitter uh, yesterday that, you know, it, this strategy that we've got right now is akin to saying we don't need firefighters or fire prevention strategies. We'll just build more burn units. That can't be the way we, we get out of this. So um, these on the slide are the, the strategies that we have right now for preventing COVID-19. I have an italics pharmacotherapeutics. Uh, so that would be the question. Are there medications that can be uh, used to prevent uh, COVID-19 infection? Um, next slide, please. So I think the big elephant or horse in the room um, is ivermectin. Uh, and you know, there's been a lot of data and there are clinical trials that are ongoing right now um, looking at ivermectin for the prevention and treatment of COVID-19. Uh, this is a Cochrane review that was done um, earlier this year and published in July. Uh, bottom line is, is right now the, the data from these clinical trials um, is of poor quality uh, and the evidence is equivocal, meaning that we don't have quality evidence so far to say that ivermectin should be used either for the prevention or treatment of COVID-19. This particular uh, review looked at 14 randomized clinical trials uh, at, that were assessing ivermectin for the prevention or treatment of um, covid and bottom line, um, even though they include a, included a large number of participants, uh, there's 1,678 participants included, um, the recommendation was that we can't proceed with um, recommending ivermectin either for the prevention or treatment of COVID-19 at the time. But there are many, many trials that are ongoing still. Uh, clinicaltrials.gov um, shows as of today, there are 79 clinical trials uh, on ivermectin and COVID-19. So we should have more data forthcoming. Next slide, please. I'll just skip over this, I guess, quickly because uh, this is just the, the one lone RCT that they found uh, that was uh, assessing COVID-19 for the prevention of, uh, sorry, uh, ivermectin for the prevention of SARS-CoV-2 infection. Uh, and ultimately, um, no recommendation could be made uh, because the, the trial was not of sufficient evidence uh, to be able to make the patient to use COVID or uh, ivermectin for prevention of COVID. Uh, next slide, please. AHS has uh, released a report, and this is available for everyone to read. It's in the public domain. Uh, so earlier this year, and then it was revised again, I believe back in July when the Cochrane Review came out, 
um, that at this time, ivermectin should not be prescribed or taken to prevent COVID-19 outside of a clinical trial. Although uh, scientists and physicians are encouraged to um, uh, recommend patients if there's a relevant clinical trial that they're eligible for, that they should be considered for that. Next slide, please. And so this slide is just showing how very complicated uh, the pathophysiology of uh, COVID infection is. And so when you have the, and, and thus the, the treatment strategies are very um, complicated as well. So early in the course of disease, you've got the viral response phase, and that's where we're looking at uh, antiviral medications and things to reduce um, viral load and, and that kind of thing. And then as the disease progresses, there's this really aberrant or out of control host inflammatory response. And that's really often responsible for some of the very severe outcomes that we see in patients who are very, um, very unwell with COVID. Um, and so the treatment strategies for these different phases of infection or phases of disease uh, differ. Um, you can see early on there's antivirals, antimalarials, gyvermectin being studied. Uh, and then later on in the course of disease, we're looking at things to kind of mitigate or abrogate that um, out of control host inflammatory bonds. So things like um, tocilizumab, uh, that's an anti-interleukin-6 um, inhibitor and things like some of the other monoclonal antibodies. But again, you can see those treatments are reserved then when somebody is very, very sick, and we don't want someone to get that to that phase for sure. Uh, and some of those treatments, I should also say, are very much in short supply, and they're also um, uh, incredibly expensive, and they can come with their own uh, array of side effects as well. Uh, next slide, please. So ideally, really, really, really want to prevent people from getting badly sick. Uh, this is just showing you that as of today, there's 6,000 and some uh, clinical trials looking at treatment options and strategies for COVID-19 uh, that are occurring worldwide. So, um, you know, we're not all putting ourselves into this. Uh, vaccine is the only um, uh, strategy uh, box. Uh, definitely, there's lots of, of work being done worldwide. But as of today, right now, I would say, and it should be uh, forever more, that prevention of disease is is uh, definitely something that we would uh, rather see uh, than people getting sick, especially sick enough to require uh, care in hospital. Next slide, please. So how do the vaccines work? Um, so in Canada, we've got uh, approval of uh, two different types of vaccines. So we've got the mRNA vaccines, and that's Pfizer and Moderna. And we've got the viral vector vaccines. Um, so the ones that are improved, approved in Canada are AstraZeneca and um, uh, the, the Janssen vaccine, but we have not been using the Janssen vaccine in Alberta yet. Um, the, vac the mRNA vaccines uh, contain material from the virus that causes COVID-19. So essentially that gives our cells instructions for how to make a harmless protein that is very similar to the virus. After our cells make copies of that protein, they destroy that genetic material from the vaccine. And then our bodies will recognize that protein should not be there and build special types of white blood cells, T lymphocytes and B lymphocytes that will remember how to fight the virus that causes COVID if we're infected in the future. Um, and then the viral vector vaccines contain a modified version of, different, of a different virus uh, and so adenovirus is the one uh, that we're using so far. Um, so that's a different virus than the one that causes COVID-19. And the reason we use that is it, it helps to get the, uh, the messages into our cells. And inside the shell of the modified virus, there's a material from the virus that causes COVID-19. That's the viral vector piece. And once the viral vector is inside our cells, the genetic material gives cells instructions to make a protein that's unique to the virus that causes COVID-19. And using the instructions, um, our cells make copies of the protein. And then this, again, prompts our bodies to build T lymphocytes and B lymphocytes that will remember how to fight the virus if we're infected. Um, it's important to note that there are no fetal cells in these vaccines and there's no metal in these vaccines. You will not become magnetized. Um, that's just not possible. Uh, next slide, please. Oh, this is just a cartoon showing uh, that both the mRNA vaccine and the adenoviral vector vaccine. Uh, so... Um, AstraZeneca or Janssen uh, produce, um, will eventually cause your T cells and B cells to produce, um, your body to produce T cells and B cells so that you'll remember uh, the infection and the virus if you uh, become infected at some point in the future. So your body is prepped and prepared should you uh, encounter the virus in the future. Next slide, please. So there are lots of awesome sites and just in the interest of time, I'm not gonna get into all of the uh, myths about the vaccines or frequently asked questions, um, but I'll highlight a few um, today for you. Next slide, please. 
Um, so this is probably one of the most common ones. And I was asking my uh, family today, what questions would you have if you could ask uh, about the vaccines? And this is one that I hear so often is these vaccines were developed too fast. Um, the process was rushed. And in fact, that isn't the case. Um, you know, scientists were not starting from scratch. They had the benefit of having worked on uh, SARS and MERS uh, in the past. Um, this article that I've uh, pasted in here too uh, is, is an article about mRNA vaccines that was published in 2018. So even pre-COVID, uh, there were a number of um, studies that were ongoing and were um, looking at uh, mRNA vaccine technology. Um, there was also worldwide collaboration, uh, lots of funding uh, that was easily available, readily available, which is sometimes a barrier for clinical trials. And then they also had the benefit of easily recruiting participants, um, which is something that is also quite unusual for clinical trials. Um, next, please. I'm gonna get through these real fast so we can get, um, so uh, yeah, we'll talk about this, I'm sure in the discussion. Yes, there can be some serious side effects. They're exceedingly rare and they are treatable. So when I vaccinate people, I always tell them what to watch for, for these side effects. Uh, next slide. And the vaccine safety. So we've got data from Canada um, and in worldwide. We know now uh, more than 6 billion doses have been administered worldwide, uh, 55 million doses in Canada. Um, and, you know, we hear a lot about adverse events being reported, um, but 11,000 of these were considered non-serious. So that would be like the sore arm, uh, tingling, prickling, the vaccination site headache. Some of these were serious. 201 out of, you know, 55 million doses were uh, resulted in anaphylaxis. And there have been six deaths uh, reported. And that's that vaccine-induced thrombotic thrombocytopenia, that rare clotting um, uh, disorder that we saw with the viral vector vaccines. Uh, next slide. And I'll just say that you can get these bad things uh, with COVID infection too. And this one study shows that in fact, all these bad things that can happen with the vaccines happen way more frequently um, with COVID infection. This was a huge study done in Israel. And I think that is all I have to say. <laughs> I think I'm done. And pregnancy, I know Dr. Cooper will talk about pregnancy. So I will uh, oh. sign off for now. Thanks.